It is now April 15th of 1912, 112 years ago today. The next hour of the Titanic turns into one of the most dramatic turns in history. So how did we get here, you may ask? Well, you can pause the video right here and actually go back to April 14th, 1912, Part 2 with the Iceberg Collision and the previous part to April 15th, 1912, then actually do come back here. It is now 1 a.m. where we last left off as of lowering a lifeboat 8, which was lowered around this time. This boat had an occupancy of 25 out of the 65 seats that are available. It is also around this time that the Turkish baths on F deck has started to flood. And possibly the biggest piece of advice I can actually give you right now if you're watching this, if you are ever on a sinking vessel, do not hang around in the interiors. Get out of the inside. Minutes later, lifeboat 1 is lowered with an occupancy of 12 out of 40 open seats. Only 5 passengers and 7 crew members make up this boat. Once the boat touched the water, George Simons was ordered to row some yards away from the ship and then come back when ordered. Now, I have covered Lifeboat 1 in a video before, so do feel free to check that out. I will provide a link in the description box below or as a card up on the top corner of your screen. Now, do you remember when I mentioned the Olympic would actually appear later on? Well, she actually did as she was actually on an eastbound voyage from New York to Southampton. Wireless operators Ernest James Moore or Alec Begat or whoever one of those two actually sent a service message, excuse me, from the Olympic to the Carpathia to the Titanic. So this is basically just a relay message. Basically the Carpathia is asking Titanic, hey, don't you hear the Olympic calling you? And Titanic's operator at the time frame is Jack Phillips. He actually couldn't hear the faint dots and dashes of Morse code from the Olympic was due to the, quote, rush of air and noise of steam, which is basically the steam venting out. The Olympic immediately asked who has struck an iceberg, and Titanic responded that it was them and also gave out their coordinates. Olympic received this and it was relayed to Captain Herbert Haddock on the Olympic. In a few minutes, simultaneous transmissions started to go off, making communication hard to hear for Jack Phillips and the rest of the operators. Now, keep this in mind, though. Back then, there was no different radio channels and different radio frequencies like what we have with handheld walkie-talkies. Now, these days, we go to one channel to communicate. If we need to communicate with another channel, we switch there. It took a while for the Olympic to tell all stations to stop talking and stop transmitting. Now, there is a video called Titanic in her own words that translates the dots and dashes of Morse code and translated it to English text and words. This will give you how chaotic the situation is. I will play a sample of that right about now. SOS, this is Titanic. This is Olympic. This is Titanic. This is Virginian. SOS, calling Titanic. CQD, this is Virginian. CQD, calling Titanic. This is Titanic. Cape Race to Virginia. SOS, report to your captain. SOS, the Titanic has struck iceberg and requires immediate assistance. Received. Olympic to Titanic. CQD. SOS Olympic to Titanic. This is Titanic. Carpathia to Titanic. We have struck an iceberg and are sinking. We are coming your way. SOS coming at full speed. CQD doing 15 knots. Received. Frankfurt to Titanic. Position. We are coming to you for 1.46. Olympic to Titanic. Titanic to Olympic. We are in collision with the berg. Sinking head down. Virginian calling Cape Race for 1.46 North. Tell Titanic 50. We are going to her assistance. 14 West. We are 170 miles north. Come soon as possible. Olympic to all stations. Virginian calling Cape Race. Olympic to all stations. This is Baltic. Stop talking. This is Baltic. Stop talking. Stop transmitting. Jamming. All stations stop talking. Now, that actually does tell you how chaotic and very difficult for the Olympic to communicate with the Titanic. And I can't even imagine what it's like to hear all of those dots and dashes of Morse code from every which way of every ship, such as the Mount Temple, the Frankfurt, Virginian, and many more. You can actually do understand some of them, like Titanic and the Carpathia. Now, once everyone stopped communicating, they actually allowed the Olympic to talk to the Titanic. Jack Phillips actually did look like that he did succeed until Olympic did ask, are you steering southerly to meet us? And Jack Phillips had his key over, had his hand over the key and just stopped. Like, why is he not 
getting it. Well, how are they not getting it? And he angrily sends a message saying, We are putting women off in the boats. To which Olympic, you know, finally understood the situation of what's going on. Now, as many of you know, I always like to look at the wireless transcripts of April 15th up until the end of the sinking. But now many times, I actually have forgotten about the timeline itself. So I kind of got a little bit of a head. This one happened around 1.30, but I kind of got a little ahead of myself. So we're going to jump right back in, in the previous half hour. At 1.05 a.m., Charles Lightoller ordered two men to go down to open up the D-deck gangway door on the port side. The problem is that this door is bigger than the iceberg damage that was inflicted onto the Titanic, and by opening this door, this allows water to enter in from a new way, but unfortunately, these men would never return whatsoever. Charles Lightoller never seen them again or knew that the door was open. The location of where the D-Deck gangway door opens to is inside the first class reception room in the grand staircase, to which is a much bigger room. And next to the reception room, if you go further back, is the dining room. And again, this is a very much bigger spacious area for water to flow into. At 1.10 a.m., Lifeboat 6, under the command of Quartermaster Robert Hickens, is lowered with 23 occupied seats built for 65. This is one of the most infamous lifeboats to be lowered and is the most empty. During the lowering, Margaret Brown ordered to stop lowering the lifeboat, but unfortunately, the problem is that they have only one seaman on board. Charles Lightoller up on deck looked around to see if there was anyone available. A Canadian yachtsman by the name of Major Arthur Pukins offered to go down, and Charles Lightoller allowed him to lower himself down. Along the way, dropped his wall as well and would be discovered there, for by the all of 80 years. Ready, Luckily, my good friend Sam from the story travels already covered the wall story, to which you can it's click so on the card the top of the screen as How well. Must we sit in these now, it was around this time that the sinking of the Titanic took one of the most dramatic turns and the dramatic reaching points. The sinking actually did claim the first two casualties, Jonathan Shepard and Herbert Harvey. Now, throughout the sinking, the men, along with Frederick Barrett and a few others, actually volunteered to work down below the, to pump out the water to save the Titanic and buy some time. As these men were down in the boiler room, number five, Frederick Barrett lifted up one of those big heavy manholes to run pump hoses into boiler room number six, trying to buy some time for the sinking. However, Jonathan Shepard, he wasn't aware of where he was going, you know, he was not aware of his surroundings, accidentally and unexpectedly fell in a manhole and broke both of his legs. And fireman Frederick Barrett was able to assist him and basically took him to the pump room. And due to the great pressure of the thin metal cold bunker wall that is designed that is actually not designed to be watertight whatsoever, a huge tsunami of water overtook the men down below Frederick Barrett was able to survive that tsunami of water and actually made his way up to the top by a escape ladder. Now, there's this video from a docudrama called What Sank the Titanic. They actually did a great job with the scene of the bunker wall giveaway, and I will provide you that video with the audio intact. Moving! Boiler Room 6 had by now completely filled with water, and its bulkhead collapsed. And seeing that wall is just very, very unbelievable. Seeing that video is also very unbelievable. How they actually did try to save the Titanic. But unfortunately, it was just too much. And basically, the wall had to give way. Up on the boat deck, passengers actually reported seeing mass lights in the horizon from a mystery ship in the distance. From what it actually did believe, it looks like it's a series of mass lights. The ship you see in this photo is the Leyland Steamer, the SS Californian. She was roughly 10 to 15 miles away from the Titanic 
and was stopped. And throughout the night, they had their radio system shut down due to Jack Phillips' rebuttal. An officer by the name of Second Officer Herbert Stone, along with Junior Officer James Gibson, who were actually both upon deck of the Californian, happened to notice lights of a nearby ship and rockets were fired, despite them being white and many different colors. Captain Stanley Lord, who happened to be in the chart room around that time, decides to risk full speed ahead, having to push through loose ice, and Stone reports that the Titanic is going down fast at the head. So the Californian is actually working up to 13 knots, but they wouldn't be able to reach the vessel in time. At first, they didn't know what was going on, but didn't bother to wake up the wireless operator. Now, here's a poll question for the viewers in the live chat. If you were the officer of the watch and actually do happen to notice the ship out in the distance, acting weird and firing off rockets, you know, what would you do? Leave your comments down in the comment section below and I'm going to read through them. And if you're watching this in the live chat, uh, leave a response. I like to see a response whatsoever. So, and my answer for this one, I would basically wake up the wireless operator and have them get in contact with the ship to see what the problem is, you know, see what the issue is, you know, try to understand the situation more. The rockets going up and the ship acting weird is enough to basically put the two and two together. Now, people like to scrutinize Captain Stanley Lord and the crew of the Californian for not doing anything, but the one thing they're actually guilty of, and I'm actually going to clear clear all their names, but this is the one part that they are guilty of, is basically they didn't put the two connections together. You know, a ship stopped at 11.40 p.m., matches the time script, and then it just kind of acts we weird, firing off rockets. It's just enough to put the two and two together. Had they put the connections together, they would actually understand what's going on. Now we're at the point where all order is getting ready to break down because the ultimate realization is that already half of the lifeboats are already gone. The Titanic is up to her final hour as 160 passengers out of the 2,208 have already been evacuated. The band played waltzes, marches, and songs to keep the passengers calm and in order. A notable patriotic tune called The Land of Hope and Glory is played and is actually one of my favorites as well. One song that the band played a lot of times during the sinking is Irving Berlin's song called Alexander's Ragtime Band. It was around this time at 1.15 a.m. that guns were issued to senior officers and Cap of Captain Smith, Chief Officer Henry Wilde, First Officer William Murdoch, and Charles Lightoller. These guns, however, were kept in the lockbox in the First Officer's quarters, and since this was originally Lightoller's room, he forgot to notify Murdoch about the guns that were in his room throughout the voyage until now. Lightoller, when he was given his, saw no reason to need it, but Chief Officer Henry Wilde shoved the gun back into Lightoller's hand and said, You may need it. Lightoller then put the gun in his pocket, unloaded. Another dramatic turn to the sinking of the Titanic is the opening of the D deck gangway door on the port side. Now, earlier in the video, Second Officer Charles Lightoller ordered six men to go down to the D-Deck gangway door and open it and so that way there's a means of passengers getting off the ship from there. There's one big problem though. You have to remember this gangway door is much bigger than the iceberg damage that was actually inflicted on the Titanic. It actually gives water free will and free access into more open areas of the ship that are still dry. And this would also have an effect on the list of the ship as well. So a lot of speculation like to say that the D-Deck gangway door was actually blown open when the Titanic slammed into the ocean floor. While sure, it, it, it was plus, plausible, but it was never been confirmed anyway. You see, Charles Lytar did order men down, and these men never came back up. I mean, they were told, Charles Lytar, that the door is open, and Lytar never seen them again or basically knew that the door was open. A very appropriate way of describing the effect of the list of the Titanic is her future sister ship, the HMHS Britannic. Now, when the Britannic did struck the mine in the Aegean Sea in 1916, it compromised six of the 16 watertight compartments. While, sure, this ship actually did have safety features that were implemented after the Titanic disaster, such as the double hull extending from the bow all the way back to the engine room, and also one added watertight compartment door where the generators and the dynamo is. And basically with six flooded compartments, this basically means that the ship has reached its maximum limit 
for the Britannic and it can stay well above the water. However, one problem is nurses open up portholes along E deck and F deck because it was actually a hot, a very hot day, and this actually allowed water to penetrate further and further into the ship to flood much more quicker, basically bypassing more watertight compartments in to which that she eventually listed in the final moments. Now ships usually tend to roll over on their sides in the final plunge, but the way Titanic sank is very unique and actually went down on an even heel rather than going over. But I'll, I'll discuss that when we get to it. FIFO 16 is lowered at 1.28 a.m. with an occupancy of 53 passengers. Aboard this lifeboat is a stewardess named Violet Jessup, who previously had an encounter between the HMS Hawk and the RMS Olympic collision in 1911 and will later survive the sinking of Titanic's unmet sister ship, the HMHS Britannic, while she served as a nurse in World War I. But hey, that's another story for another time and she's a well-known name within the Titanic and Ocean Liner community. She was given a baby to look after by an officer, preferably Moody. Perhaps I'm getting, kind of getting ahead of myself way too quickly with the HMHS Britannic for now. Let me know down in the comments box for a future documentary of the HMHS Britannic. After the lifeboat lowering of Lifeboat 16, 5th Officer Low and 6th Officer Moody had a discussion on who should take command of Lifeboat 14. Now, Lowe actually took in charge of this lifeboat due to higher rank and much more responsibility. Lowe also takes a spot after Moody assists, and around that time, orders beginning to start to break down around that general front area whatsoever. A crowd one charge into lifeboat 14 were actually held off by the crew. And lifeboat 14's only handle was only filled up with 40, and this conversation alone actually determined who will live and who will die. Lifeboat 9 will be lowered at 1.30 a.m. with an occupancy of 40, as this would be one of the last few boats that would be lowered to a little over half full. Crew inside lifeboat number 14 were fighting off a mob on the A-deck promenade underneath lifeboat 14. Fifth Officer Lowe fired off warning shots to keep order as the lifeboat was lowered. It would be a sign of things to come. The rest of the lowering without any further incident and no one was shot, but the gunshots calmed the passengers down. The lifeboat 12 proceeded to be lowered at the same time with only 42 occupied seats. Back over on starboard, lifeboat 11 is launched with 50 occupied seats. What they don't know is that there's a condenser discharge they're going to be lowering up on top of it. But luckily, due to the list, they barely touched the water next to it. The next lifeboat to be lowered right away is lifeboat number 13. This is one of the most infamous lifeboats since there's a few individuals in there that we know such as Ruth Becker who actually pushed her way into lifeboat number 13 second class passenger and later author Lawrence Beasley lookout Reginald Lee and in command is fireman Frederick Barrett who survived boiler rooms 6 and 5 50 already occupied the lifeboat and this one went through a series of unfortunate events so what are condensers well Titanic actually happened to have two condensers that actually take some seawater from the outside to cool the water that they had as a part of the ship's steam engine, and they were actually designed to transfer heat from the steam back into the water, thus cooling it down. Now, Titanic had two condenser ports, one underneath lifeboat 13 and 14 respectively. Lifeboat 13 was actually lowered up on top of the still discharging condenser underneath them. What they were actually supposed to do was they were actually supposed to slack off from the front end where the bow of the lifeboat is and basically have that swing around and basically release from from the one fall thus disconnecting the row away from the ship altogether before lifeboat 15 comes down but however things actually did not go the way that they expected the next lifeboat to be lowered is lifeboat number 15 which is full and overloaded by three, making it the only lifeboat to be lowered at its full or beyond capacity. As soon as lifeboat 13 touches the water, the discharge port pushes lifeboat 13 underneath where lifeboat 15 is coming down upon top of it. Passengers in both 13 and 15 start yelling at the officers up on the top deck to stop, but they could not be heard as the boat was still coming down upon top, thus risking a crushing and swamping. Frederick Barrett, who thought quickly, 
grab his knife and start cutting away on the ropes and successfully free lifeboats 13 and 15 that came down into the water safely. Let me tell you one thing, Frederick Barrett's quick thinking actions of cutting the ropes actually did save more lives and he's actually one of the true blood heroes of the Titanic. Now, he survived three different death situations, basically the iceberg collision into boiler room number six, the collapse of the cold bunker wall in boiler room number five, and of course, just recently, the lifeboat 15 coming down up on top of 13. You have to think about this. This man went through hell and back. I will do a dedicated video of Frederick Barrett real soon. After the series of unfortunate events involving lifeboats 13 and 15, lifeboat 2 is launched by Henry Wilde under the command of Joseph Boxhall. Captain Smith wants Boxhall to row around the Titanic to a gangway door and pick up more passengers from there. It is also at this time that the huge bronze propellers start rising up out of the water. Minutes later, flight boats 10 and 4 were lowered all together, being the last two regular light boats to be lowered. Lifeboat 10 was actually originally in charge by Charles Yalkin, who refused a seat, but it is taken by Steward William Burke along with two other seamen. Yalkin will go down on a deck looking for more women and children, and although he did notice some women and children on deck, he would forcefully take them up on deck and basically throw them into the boat. In one attempt, a woman lost footing and slipped between Lipo 10 and the Titanic, hung upside down. And miraculously, she was hauled into the A-deck promenade by Burke. Throughout the night, Charles Yalkin made it his personal mission to make sure, and yes, to make sure that the Titanic goes down with little alcohol as possible. Throughout the night, he's been going down to his stateroom or cabin whatever you guys like to say it, drink some whiskey, go back up on deck to assist, then go back down to take another swig of whiskey, and then when he came back, all of a sudden, he found his room underwater. Life of Four was lowered to an A-deck window throughout the whole night. Lightoller and Colonel Gracie proceeds to help women into the lifeboat. He helped two women into the boat, but was actually blocked by a line of crew members. Lightoller allowed Gracie to assist the lifeboats. John Jacob Astor allowed Gracie to help his pregnant wife Madeline into this lifeboat and try to offer himself on board. But unfortunately, Lightoller declined Astor's request, and the flooding of the Titanic is now progressing much quicker than it previously was. At first, it started off slow, but once the bulkhead wall to boiler room number 5 collapsed and the opening of the D-deck gangway door, it allowed water to flow into the dining room and into more open areas. Back into the wireless room, Jack Phillips started to become in a trance. He zoned out and started having mental breakdowns because he needs to get his ship to them as quickly as possible. It's at this time that he and Brian notice that the power is starting to dwindle down. Now, when we actually do know about this, they had a front row seat to what's going on with the power to the Titanic. The rest of the passengers actually never noticed it. They noticed that the lights instantly went out and that was it. Brian Phillips had a front row seat for the power dwindling down. The loss of the power basically closes the circle of how far Titanic can communicate, basically being the first is the Cape Race land station in Newfoundland. The last words he said to the RMS Olympics wireless operators, we are putting the women off in the boats, we are putting the passengers off in small boats. Women and children in boats cannot last much longer, losing power. The power is failing due to the engineers that have now been taken on water and the dynamos may fail at any time as Captain Smith informed Phillips of the situation, to which Phillips communicated and tried to get a ship to their location, basically saying engine room getting flooded, engine room getting flooded two times. At this very same time, Captain Smith called lifeboats back to be filled with capacity, but not one of the half-filled boats actually did went back to the ship especially one specific lifeboat, lifeboat number six. As Quartermaster Higgins talked, Molly Brown, Helen Caney, and Mary Eloy Hughes-Smith are going back to the ship to pick up more passengers. Give it the credit that the suction will pull us down. The final distress rocket was fired at 1.52 a.m. At this time, the California's officers were able to see it explode over the horizon. Currently, there are two Engelhard collapsible lifeboats that are being filled. C on the starboard side and D on the port side. 
Titanic also has two additional ones up on top of the officers' quarters, basically collapsible A on the starboard side and B on the port side. Around this time, shots were being fired around collapsible C, and two men, two men were witness to have guns were Murdoch and Purser Hugh McElroy. As collapsible C would be loaded, witnesses heard two pistol shots in the air, and these shots were either McElroy or Murdoch using pistols to keep back the crowd from storming the lifeboat. Two key witnesses, Eugene Daly and Jack Thayer, said they were two different, which is Murdoch and McElroy all together. It is possible that McElroy fired the two pistol shots while staying inside collapsible C, to which it canceled out the popular belief of the Murdoch double murder suicide that we saw in the James Cameron film. Captain Smith would relieve the wireless operators of their duty, saying, Men, you have done your full duty. You can do no more. Abandon your cabin. Now it's every man for himself. After the captain gave the order, Phillips continued tapping the Morse key, messaging the SS Virginian, the Baltic, and the SS Asian. Classical C would be lowered at 1.56 a.m. with an occupancy of 43. Among those is managing director of the White Star Line, Bruce Ismay. Now, it is unknown if Bruce Ismay actually did took this seat, if he was ordered into it or took up the opportunity because there was no one around. But regardless of either way, Bruce Ismay would have been scrutinized by the media and be a scapegoat to the sinking of the Titanic. To me, I personally say that Bruce Ismay was ordered into the lifeboat by William Murdoch and he tried everything to do it in his power to not be spotted by American authorities once he got to New York and tried to order a ship and the crew back to the United Kingdom before being spotted by American authorities and be brought in for questioning. The one thing that actually did not look good on Ismay's part was him signing his name backwards that says Yamsey. During the lowering of Classical C, the boat rubbed against the hull of Titanic, threatening to break apart or flip over the occupants. The occupants pushed the lifeboat away from the hull as the boat is still being lowered into the water. Collapsible C would touch the water with no further incident. As 2 a.m. hits, we now finally enter the final 20 minutes of Titanic's life. 